such kids you are, dismissed to go to your classes. And we're going to let John McCollum come up and share the word this morning. Thank you, April. Well, it is good to be with you here this morning. As April said, uh, my name is John McCollum. For those of you who don't know me, Pastor Jeff and a, and a large group is in uh, Guatemala. I actually understand on their way back this morning from Guatemala, so keep them, keep them in your prayers. I was reminded this morning my Bible cover I bought in Guatemala when I was there a few years ago at the market in Antigua. Which is there they are. There's uh, the guy in the red shirt there is Kevin Applegate. He is the missionary there who Pastor Jeff hired at his previous church. And uh, Kevin felt a call to go down and lead this effort in Guatemala. So lots of teams come down and work with them. You see some of your folks there doing work on a, on a stage, I understand, in the church there in Guatemala as a worship center. One of the ovens that they... Uh, that they are building there and using. They are very proficient at using ovens without any tools, just hand doing tortillas and all. We learned that when we were there a couple years ago. They didn't use any of our tortillas because they were so misshapen. <laughs> but uh, Stephanie? So keep that group in your prayers as they travel back because I know they had a great experience down there and they're going to be sharing that with you for the next, over the course of the next several years, I'm sure. Well, our topic again this week, as it has been for the last couple weeks, what God wants us to know about him. I don't know how much uh, Pastor Jeff told you, but uh, he was doing something of a holy experiment here the last couple weeks. Uh, same topic, different speaker. And we have consciously tried to not coordinate between the three of us, just seeing where the Holy Spirit would lead each of us on that same topic. So hopefully there are some similarities and hopefully there are some key differences between what you've heard the last couple of weeks and what you hear today. Just as in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost and the disciples spoke in different tongues. The message was the same, but each of them heard the disciples speaking in their own language in their own tongue, what they understood. So how the Lord speaks through Pastor Jeff and through Michael last week and through me this week should be motivated by the same spirit, but uh, uh, each one of those messages should be slightly different. Now, to be honest with you, I'm coming to this from an engineering background, so very left brain, logical, linear thinking. I like bullet lists. I like definitions. I like specs. And I kind of struggled with that topic. What does God want us to know about him? Is that the things that no one knows about God? If it is, well, it's kind of presumptive of me to get up here and preach on that today. Nobody knows him. So is it the most frequent misconceptions that we have about God? What does God want us to really know about him? Is it the things that God has already taught us that he really wishes we'd take to heart and put into practice? Or is it the things that we most often forget about God? Well, I think, I'm thinking as I'm planning this in my mind, or trying to plan this message in my mind, I thought of Isaiah 55, 8, and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, oh, there we go. Uh, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. All right, well, that's not exactly helpful, because that tells me that even on my best day, if I could ace my SATs and turn around and write a message right after that, I wouldn't even come close, because my thoughts and his thoughts are light years apart. So I kind of had to step back and think, all right, what does God want us to know about him? 
Well, I understand that there are two ways to know something. One is intuitively, and one is experientially. Intuitively, I know that if I did a sermon illustration that involved me doing gymnastics up here, I know intuitively that my high deductible health care plan would reach its out-of-pocket maximum before the end of this month. I don't know that experientially, but I know that intuitively. I also know experientially that if I had gotten the 24-ounce coffee before I started preaching, that this would be one of the shortest sermons ever. Or it'd be your first sermon with a halftime. <laughs> okay, so I think God wants us to know both, to know both ways, intellectually, intuitively, and experientially. They reinforce each other. What we learn in the real world influences our our intuition about God, our intuition is shaped and grows, and our experiences uh, inform that. At the very core of our experience, of our being, what does he want us to know? So that kind of led me to this question and this direction for the message today. What is it that we have the toughest time mentally grasping and holding on to about God? Because we either so quickly forget or because it so easily gets crowded out with all the other stuff that comes into our heads and flushes through over the course of a day. Such that when that happens, that word, that thing that God wants us to know, doesn't even have time to stick around in our heads and take root and grow and bear fruit. So what's the thing that's most often repeated in the Bible that God has to uh, tell us over and over and over again because it has such a tough time sticking around in our heads. The most repeated. Hmm. When God repeats himself, we need to pay attention because when he repeats himself, that implies the significance of the message. Now, I didn't say that the most repeated message is the most important message because the most important command if you recall, the man came up to Jesus one time and said, what's the greatest commandment? And what did he say was the greatest, the most important? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But the most repeated commands, we find out, actually helps, helps us to obey the most important command. Let me repeat that because it's so important. The most repeated commands help us to obey the most important command. They work together. We don't sacrifice one for the other. So that's where I'm starting this morning. What is God's most repeated command in the Bible? You may have heard that before. Scholars tell us that it's the command to fear not. Fear not. Don't fear. Now, it's easy for someone to say to someone, uh, don't fear, don't worry about it. But how can we not fear? Because you and I got to confess, we actually have a lot of good logical reasons to fear in this world today, to have anxiety. I mean, look around on the TV, Internet, radio, newspapers, magazines. There are as many reasons to despair and have anxiety as there are opportunities in the day. About a month ago, I was in northern Minnesota, had been there fishing for a week, and uh, we were leaving to come home. I got up at 4 a.m. with the rest of uh, uh, my brother and sister and their family, and we started, loaded the car, and started our journey home. And this happened about 5.15 a.m. Do we have that picture? Ah, apparently the picture is not there. There is a picture somewhere in cyberspace of an extremely flat tire on the back of my minivan. I mean, not just a hole. I mean, here's the rim and here's the tire. And they are not attached any longer. And so at 5.15 a.m., 5.15 a.m., on a two-lane rural road in northern Minnesota, seven to eight miles from a city either direction, on a road that we had just previous, moments earlier, seen a wolf cross this road, 
you know, a wolf as in the animal that will eat you? That's where I got to change a tire at 5.15 a.m. I had plenty of reasons to fear. You know, guys, do you recall that a tire iron used to be a pretty formidable method of self-defense? Not anymore. I might as well have had a ballpoint pen out there for self-defense. I did, however, have my sister, and she's slower than me, so the wolf would have got her. So that was kind of a defense thing, but, you know, I'd have felt bad, but I'd have got over it. You know? <laughs> so anyway, I had a lot of reasons to fear. Long story short, and there's a story behind the tire change also, uh, you know, we got the tire changed. We got four new tires in Duluth, Minnesota on an as-needed basis made our way home that day. So there was a lot of good reasons to fear with that wolf out there, all right? But somehow we made it. There are many valid reasons to fear in life. You know, it seems that as we go through the day, there are not a whole lot of things that just make us overflow with positivity. The world seems to want to beat us down. But yet throughout the scripture, the people of God are told over and over again to fear not don't fear. And to me, that implies that fear not requires a conscious, purposeful decision. It's a, an act of the will to not fear. It's almost like God is saying, in spite of what you see and hear, choose to not fear. Choose to not fear. And reboot whenever necessary. <laughs> choose to not primarily consider what others are saying and doing and what you see in the culture around you. Choose to not fear. Choose to keep your eyes on me. Choose, and we do that through studying his word so that we know what is in the Bible, not what other people say is in the Bible. Please check out my scripture references for yourself. Choose. There you go. There's, there's an extremely flat tire. No argument there. So, so we keep our eyes on Christ by studying his word through prayer, through worship, and through fellowship with one another. We grow in our relationship with God. And when you say keeping your eyes on Jesus, that's a nice phrase that gets thrown around, but what exactly does that mean? I touched on that a little bit, but it reminds me of Peter, that story where he walks out to Jesus on the Sea of Galilee during the storm. We read that in Matthew 14. We pick up at verse 26. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, and they said, it's a ghost, and they cried out in fear. And Peter, uh, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Fear not. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come on. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and he came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? See, while he was in the boat, Peter made a conscious decision to step out and go toward Jesus in spite of what he saw all around him. You know, this course of action makes no sense at all if you grew up on the Sea of Galilee. During a storm like that, you just don't go out. That's what common sense tells you. In addition, no one would ever think of trying to walk on the water. And if you were going to do it, you'd do it during good weather, not in the middle of the night during a raging storm, okay? Okay, if you're going to do something like that, logic and common sense says to sit tight and just ride out the storm. And if you do survive, learn from it and don't do something like that again. Except for this time. Because you see, this time, Jesus is right in the middle of this time. 
this time is not just an unfortunate situation, it's an unprecedented opportunity. And Jesus calls Peter out into the midst of the chaos and he tests his faith. He tests putting his belief into practice. And you know what? Peter did a pretty good job of walking on the water right up until the time he took his eyes off Jesus. As long as he was focused on Christ, Peter did fine. But when he allowed himself to be distracted by what was around him, what was going on, he fell into deep trouble. Quite literally, he fell into deep trouble. And we will too. See, the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. Peter walked on the water by faith. He sank by sight. Jesus tells us, fear not. Fear not. But think about that. The opposite of fear is what? Faith. Trust. And so when the Lord tells his followers to fear not, that could be restated if you wanted to state that in the positive sense. Instead of fear not, you could say, trust me, trust in the Lord, trust God. There's a passage in Proverbs that I hadn't planned on using in this message, but it kept coming up in my mind over and over and over. And it pretty well summarizes uh, the way this message works out. And that's this, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord, don't fear. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him or submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Do not fear. Rather, trust in the Lord with all your heart. But man, it is tough to trust God, and it is tough to not fear when everything that's going on around us is frightening and upsetting. But you see, that's just it. Everything that you see, everything that you and I see is not all that there is. What you and I see is not all there is. There is more going on than just what we see. God is always working along behind the scenes, behind what we see. And we read evidence of this all throughout the Bible. Classic example, Joseph. Remember from the amazing Technicolor dream coat? Story of Joseph. He's thrown in a pit by his brothers. Nice guys, huh? He's sold as a slave. He winds up in a dungeon in Egypt. If Joseph evaluated God's goodness based on what he felt like, what he felt like when he was in the well, when he was a slave, when he was in an Egyptian dungeon, he would have come to a very wrong conclusion about God's love for him. But the Bible reminds us that God was with Joseph and God had an awesome plan in motion. Even when Joseph probably would have said, boy, if God does have a plan, I sure don't see it. And there was more going on than just what Joseph saw. Another great example of this is found in 2 Kings, one of the stories of the prophet Elisha, who was a prophet in the, in the land after Elijah. Elisha, this is a different guy. So let me set up the story here. The king of Syria, the country to the east of Israel, is attacking Israel. They're sending raiding parties, ambushes. They're setting them up in various places and robbing people and doing all kinds of awful things. Well, they set them up, and Elisha knows this from the Lord. He goes and tells the king of Israel. The king of Israel sends out people to attack the people lying in ambush from Syria. And this doesn't happen just once. This happens over and over and over again. Syrians set up an ambush. Israel comes and attacks them, drives them off over and over again. I'm paraphrasing here. But one day, the king of Syria calls a staff meeting. And he says, hey, what is going on? We have a mole. I'm telling you, we have a mole amongst us. And his officers say, none of us is the mole. It's Elisha. 
he tells, he tells the king of Israel the very words that you speak in your bedroom. And uh, the king of Syria goes, where is Elisha? And they say, he's living in Dothan, or he's, he's, he's staying in Dothan. Now, when I lived in Pensacola, Florida, the people there loved this illustration because the city of Dothan, Alabama is about two hours away, and a lot of them got relatives there. So they loved to hear that Elisha lived in Dothan, different Dothan. So let me pick up here. So the king says, all right, if he's there, I'm going to send an army, and I am going to get Elisha. So let me pick up the scripture in verse 14 of 2 Kings 6. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night, and they surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God, that's the servant of Elisha, his assistant, arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Well, there's Old Testament wording for you. I think we probably would have said it differently this, this day and age. We are toast. Have you seen this group? What are we going to do? And so Elisha answered, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. See, the Syrians just had the city surrounded. God's army had the Syrians surrounded. I'll leave it to you to read the rest of the story, but it's really cool. 2 Kings 6. There was more going on, obviously, than Elisha's servant first saw. We humans don't always see things as they fully are. Often we don't. Usually we don't see things as they fully are. I was reminded of this last weekend, went and had an eye test, went to the eye doctor, new prescription. It had been about five years, so it was way past time to get it redone. And I was encouraged to know that my distance vision was getting better. I got a new prescription, I got a new pair of glasses, and I'm still getting used to them. And um, the bad news was my close-up reading vision was getting a lot worse. And the other news was, I asked them about being colorblind, and she asked me a few questions, showed me a couple of those tests where there's supposed to be numbers in those series of dots. I think it's a psychological test as much as it is a color test, how you react to it. But the good news is, my colorblind isn't going to get any worse. The bad news is, it's never going to get any better. Some things I just cannot see. This was a sunset, uh, a beautiful sunset, I'm told, picture that I took when I was up in Minnesota there on vacation. Scientifically speaking, there's a lot more colors in that than I can recognize, but with these human eyes, I cannot and I never will be able to see that picture fully. Spiritually speaking, there is always more going on in our lives than just what we can see. We don't see things with human eyes as they fully and truly are. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, that's always read at uh, weddings, it seems, ends with these words. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. So whenever I read this verse, what comes to mind is looking at something uh, not with new glasses, not with rose-colored glasses, but what comes to mind is looking at something with wax paper glasses. If I had my glasses on, I see things kind of dimly. I see big picture things, shapes, motion, light, dark. But details, eh, it's 
can't see a whole lot of details. That's what comes to mind when I think of eventually, one day, when we are face to face with God's perfect love, then we will see things as they truly are. Then I will be able to see all the colors in that sunset on that day. I read a great reminder in a devotional this week. It says, what we know about God from his word is more accurate than what we feel. What we know about God from his word is more accurate than what we feel with our emotions, with our human observations and perceptions. That's why it's so important that we know the word of God, that we study, study the Bible, that we read it, that we discuss, that we learn. What we know about God from his word is more accurate than what we feel. So let's review. Don't fear there are, because there is more going on than just what we can see. You know, God's got a plan. And the best news for those of us who are recovering perfectionists, getting it right, is that Jesus says to us, I've got this. I got this. That is encouraging. Not only does the Lord have this for Christ followers, the Bible teaches that he's had it since the beginning of time. In Jeremiah 29, 11, God declares this to his followers. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. That is glorious, amazing, good news. God is not like us at all. He is not making this up as he goes. He's had it planned out for a long time. He's been working behind the scenes of what we can see for our entire lives, probably even longer than that. See, personally, I find great encouragement in several verses that are in Romans 8, another great chapter to read, Romans 8. Paul says in 8.28, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now understand that. That doesn't mean that everything that happens to us is going to be a good thing. But nothing that happens to us is a surprise to the Lord. Because remember, there's always more going on than just what you and I see. And there is no human situation that God can't work for our ultimate good or to advance his kingdom. Romans 8, 31, just a couple of verses later, says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can ultimately be against us? If God's for us, who can be against us? Game, set, match, you know, that's it. If God is for us, who can be against us? In Philippians, Paul reminds us that God has already started a good work in us, and he will be faithful to complete it. In other words, God's got this. I got this. Not only does he have it, but we can't lose it. Because continue on in Romans 8, 8, 38, and 39, Paul writes this, And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, there's that word fear again, don't fear, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell itself can separate us from God's love. So back to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Fear not. Trust in the Lord. And do not lean on your own understanding. There's more going on than just what you and I see. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. God says, I got this. Have faith. He will make our paths straight. But for our part, we got a part in this too. We are the ones that have to walk that path each and every day and walk it consciously choosing 
to not fear. Because God promises that he goes before us. The word says that he goes before us. He goes with us. And he comes behind us as we walk this road of life. So let's keep our eyes on Jesus. And like Peter, take that.